see or perish, wrote Pierre Teilhard de Chardin in his prologue to the human phenomenon, see or perish. Let's consider this direction for our first week in Lent. Imagine Jesus going into the desert and our going with him and learning to see more clearly. And the Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. He was in the wilderness for 40 days, tempted by Satan. And he was with the wild beasts, and the angels waited on him. We are all invited to his desert campsite this Lent. Today's readings remind us of our belovedness and our purity upon entering the desert. Noah's flood, Jesus' baptism, and our own. In good conscience, all of these prepare us for the challenge ahead. The change of landscape crossing from the river into the wilderness invites us to look more closely, to see more fully the trouble as well as the angels around us. It's a rude awakening from the wet cleansing of baptism to the dry, dangerous desert, hot during the day and cold at night. The desert is so inhospitable that one doesn't go unprepared or without good reason. It's still not too late to turn back. I, for one, don't like camping. The sound of the village just bordering the desert is still audible. The glee of children playing at the river, vendors selling their goods, call out. Comforts and distractions might help at a challenging time. Why observe Lent again? It's certainly less effort to blithely continue the uninterrogated path In a recent Facebook post, retired history and theology professor, the Reverend Dr. Rebecca Lyman, said, we are less likely to commit any of the very dramatic sins. Instead, we are more likely to sin by living living comforting half-lives of faithfulness. Duchardin wrote, one could say that the whole of life lies in seeing. To try to see more and to see better, he continues, is not, therefore, just a fantasy, curiosity, or a luxury. See or perish. This is the situation imposed by the mysterious gift of existence, and thus, to a higher degree, this is the human condition. It is our condition to be able to see, though often we manage not to or choose to ignore what is before us. But seeing leads to fullness of life. Lent's change of habits invites us to slough off the blankets of comfort we put over our heads and to look anew. Our Lenten disciplines, our walk with Jesus in the desert, invite us to claim our human condition, the ongoing invitation to see as God sees, life with God. The last desert I visited was in Joshua Tree National Park, just a short drive from Palm Springs. Both desert worlds, but worlds apart. Gone were the sparkling pools, white pebbled and manicured yards, notably angled pastel homes and vintage cars with joyously pumping stereos. The half-life of the mid-century design era, proudly incalculable. The desert, you see, operates in a completely different time. The hands of its geological clock face are hidden a glimpse of eternity's mysteriously evolving stillness. 
The first thing I learned while in Joshua Tree was that I had to look very carefully to know what I was seeing. Because the landscape there isn't a single desert, but a meeting place for two, the Mojave and Colorado. A ranger sign illustrated a slow blending of terrains, plant and animal biodiversity, the distinct elements of the two ecosystems, impossible for me to see without help. Visitors are also advised to be on the lookout for dangers, such as deadly toxins and spikes that help plants and animals defend themselves in sparse and competitive conditions. The sign advised us to look out both so we could learn and so we could keep safe. Much like the delights and dangers of the desert call for careful attention, our invitation to Lent is also to see carefully and in a new way, to see the things that enliven us and to get out of the way of those that deaden. In this simplified Lenten season where excess is dampened and indulgences are muted, we can notice, like a changing interior landscape, thoughts and habits that encroach on our life with God. I'm told the New York Times has an article casting light on Lent, so in balance, I'll draw from the 4th century times written by my favorite early contemplative, Evagrius Ponticus. He wrote a lot about how our thoughts often hijack us from life with God. In one of his 153 texts on prayer, Evagrius wrote in a way evocative of our time in the desert. When the demons see you truly eager to pray, they suggest an imaginary need for various things, and then stir up your remembrance of these things, inciting the intellect to go after them. And when it fails to find them, it becomes very depressed and miserable. And when the intellect is at prayer, the demons keep filling it with the thought of these things, so that it tries to discover more about them, and thus loses the fruitfulness of its prayer. Have you been there? I know I have. How do your thoughts trip you up? The desert mothers and fathers, ascetics mostly living in the Egyptian desert beginning in the first centuries after Jesus' own time in the desert, cultivated many of the practices of contemplative prayer that we use today and spoke of the virtues of wakefulness, much like the idea of seeing clearly brushing away the clutter of distraction and escape to reach the message of the heart that we have been considering. Learn to pray with your heart, and it will quiet your thoughts. A second virtue the desert mothers and fathers taught was apatheia, or indifference. Through indifference, they taught, one sees and then dismisses the ego, In so doing, one opens oneself up to what really matters, life with the divine. John Climacus taught, Most of the proud never really discover their true selves, but curate an image and limitless thirst for praise. Having rejected the thrall of the Roman Empire's materialism, military, and bother of cultivating their images, the desert ascetics freed themselves from what didn't matter and learned in the tortuous void of the desert to see what was important. To see or perish in Lent's desert is a challenging invitation to us. It requires acknowledging the dangers, even terrors, of truly stepping into this realm. What we encounter, de Chardin called the divine milieu, which he wrote, is in reality a center with the absolute power to unite. The center point of life with God 
calls us to see anew. Seeing without distraction, freed from the ego's tug of war with God's invitation, we walk knowingly toward Holy Week. On the path, like Jesus amid angels in the desert, we will find ourselves held by the Spirit. Let's stay in the desert with Jesus. Let's be here with him and see anew. Plant a step on the arid soil. See your ego in the footprint you leave behind. With the next step, open your heart. Be unconcerned with distractions and look with new eyes. See with the divine. And finally, know with clarity what God calls us to do as our work in the world today.